Well, thank you, choir. We appreciate that medley this morning. What a blessing. What a blessing. If uh, you have an interest of singing and you like to sing and you'd like to sing in the choir, uh, we would love to have you singing in the choir, provided you can sing. So uh, <laughs> if you can carry a tune, that's awesome. So, um, uh, but seriously, uh, check that out. The opportunities there, uh, I know uh, from time to time, uh, they're looking for more. And right now they are looking for additional choir uh, members here. So something to keep in mind. Well, this morning... Uh, I was thinking, I feel badly for the pastors up in New England who have to preach this Sunday. Uh, this is Sleep Deprivation Sunday. Uh, if you're a, a, a Red Sox fan, you know uh, the World Series going on. And the longest game in the World uh, Series history, uh, it took like two days to complete it, was just this week. And one of our own uh, folks here, Veronica, was able to stay up for that. I admire her for that. Uh, I, I made it till about midnight, and uh, last night I went to bed at my traditional time and figured I'd tape the game that I was sure we were going to lose. But we didn't lose it, so a uh, great day, the righteous marching. Amen. All right. <laughs> this morning we're in Mark chapter 8, and uh, I, I am just... Um, amazed at how God weaves together the subject matter in this great chapter of Scripture. Uh, just by way of, of review, we might remember in verse 27 where Jesus has gone with his disciples and he asked them the simple question, who do people say that I am? Who, who are they talking about? What are they thinking? And for many of the people, they were to be determined as far as Jesus was concerned. It was definitely a TBD scenario. And they weren't really sure if Jesus was truly the Messiah because if he was the Messiah, then they were looking for certain things that needed to be completed. Namely, they needed to see Rome dispatched and uh, the Jewish nation and culture restored to its prominence. And so they looked, and at times they weren't sure about this Jesus. At other times they were willing to get on the proverbial bandwagon, especially when Jesus was feeding them, let's be honest. Uh, that was just a, a great moment for them, and they were all excited about that when it occurred. But alas, most of them here are undecided about Jesus. And with this on the backdrop of what we're going to talk about this morning, it has definitely some impact for us. Jesus turns to the disciples after he asked the question, who do people say that I am? Looked at them and said, who do you say that I am? Put them on the spot. And Peter speaks for all of the disciples when he says, you are the Messiah, you are the anointed one. In other words, we've come to a place of faith. We are believing that you truly are who you said you are. And that is a huge watershed moment in the Gospel of Mark. In fact, most people would say that that's really the climax of Mark when Peter confesses not only for himself but for the others that are there. It was a tremendous time. Then we come to a real practical time of teaching. Jesus looks at the disciples who have declared that he's Messiah and he begins to explain to them his reason for coming. I've come so that I might take on the sins of the whole world, which means Jesus is explaining that he had to die. He was going to have to pay that penalty for our sin, and the only way to do that was to die, and he was going to be crucified on top of that, a terrible method of death, and this was the reality, and it didn't sit well with the disciples. It really wasn't part of their plan for Jesus. And so Peter, as the representative, once again calls Jesus aside and he begins to rebuke him and say, no, listen, that doesn't really work for us. And Jesus looks at him and says, get thee behind me, Satan. You see, Satan's plans were never going to detract from the motivation behind Jesus going to the cross. Jesus was going to do this. He is divinely appointed for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. After Jesus gets through rebuking Peter, and in fact the other disciples as well, he comes to the point here in verse 34 where he's going to summon the crowd. He calls
calls for not only the disciples to hear this word, but also for those in this huge crowd who have been following him around, listening to his teaching. He wants them to hear this as well. Keep in mind that this crowd that's hearing Jesus' teaching, a teaching that we will explore this morning, is still TBD, to be determined with regard to Jesus. Take your Bibles, turn with me to that chapter, Mark, uh, chapter 8, in verse 34. And let's all stand as we read God's Word together this morning, shall we? After Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Father, help us to understand this passage rightly. Help us, Father, to contemplate the words of our Savior and understand the depth of this teaching. Lord, help us to be challenged this morning and with a clear heart and mind Embrace your word. Bless it to our hearts, I pray now in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. Throughout the scripture in the gospels, Jesus comes up with a similar scenario. And he very simply is going to state, if anyone wants to be my follower, there are three things that need to happen. One is he needs to deny himself. The second is he needs to pick up his cross. And the third is he needs to follow me. These are the requirements of discipleship. If you have a handout that's in your bulletin, you'll see that there. The first point there is deny self. This is a basic condition for discipleship that Jesus Christ calls all of his followers to do. The word there in the original, deny oneself, means to put behind everything pertaining to yourself. To put it all behind you. So that you're no longer pursuing those things that you were before. It marks a distinct change for that would-be disciple of Jesus Christ. He is putting behind himself all of the trappings of this world, all of his self-ambition, all of his self-pursuits, all of those things that pertain to him. And it's a very consistent message if you look at Scripture itself. In fact, if you want to write down a verse, Titus 2, chapter 2, verse 12, says that instructing us to deny, put behind us, ungodliness and worldly desires, and live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age is what the disciple is supposed to be all about. In other words, putting those things behind us and looking forward to the Lord and Him alone is the message that He's calling these TBDers to. And so these people who are to be determined are not interested, perhaps, so much in hearing this type of message. They were much more interested in hearing a message that dealt with what Jesus was going to do for them. Does that resonate in our hearts and minds? (laughs) That's what we see today, don't we? Most people are interested, well, Jesus, what are you going to do for me? Jesus is saying, here, if you want to be my follower, you've got to deny yourself. That was a big step, wasn't it? The second point he makes here is he says, you need to take up the cross. One of the things that we're trying to do is understand what did this mean when it was spoken to the audience that was before Jesus? What would be their impact? How would they hear this? And how would they process this whole idea of taking up one's cross? It's a fair question to ask. Today, when we think of the cross, we think of it as a symbol of Christianity. We have a cross behind the screen. We have a cross over here. A lot of times churches have crosses all over the place. They, you might have crosses in your house. You might have them around your neck. Uh, it's a symbol of Christianity. But in Jesus' day, it was not. In Jesus' day, it was a method of torture and death. So when Jesus said, you need to pick up your cross and be willing to do that in order to be my disciple, This was shocking to the audience because they had, on various occasions, 
When the Roman government pronounced a death sentence on an individual, they would see that person go through the process of this crucifixion, the process of this terrible death. Remember when Jesus, and you might think back to the movie Passion of the Christ, when Jesus is going through the city and he's got that, he's got that cruel cross and he's trying to carry it and he's agonizing under that load. Part of the, the whole aspect of why the Romans used the mode of crucifixion to put people to death was to keep people, other people, from committing similar crimes. It was a time of tremendous shame. You were paraded through the town with the crucifix on your shoulder. You were paraded and everyone looked at you and they thought, what about you? What in the world crime did you commit? You must be a real terrible person to warrant this type of death. And so as Jesus is going through, remember there is absolutely no sin in Jesus. He is 100% divine, 100% human, 100% righteous. And he is paraded through there bearing the shame of my sin because that was the motivation for him to take that cross. And so Jesus is saying to the audience in front of him, you need to be willing to take up the proverbial cross. And they would have been aghast at this. What? What are you talking about? I have to, well, that's, a, that's a, a, a mechanism of shame and, and uh, presumed guilt. Why would I want to do that? And yet Jesus makes that point that by doing this, you truly are my disciple. The metaphor of taking up one's cross really shouldn't be domesticated into the concept that we're to merely endure hardship patiently. When we think of taking up our cross, isn't that what we think? We've taken this whole idea of actually suffering to the point of death, and we've domesticated it, especially here in the United States, because we look at things much more differently than other times in other places. You see, that's our MO, living in a free land where we can worship as we please. We would think of taking up our cross as having a rough day for the Lord, but that is not the message that Jesus is bringing across to this multitude that's in front of him. Jesus is talking, first of all, about his own readiness to die. Jesus is ready to die. He knows he's going to go to the cross, and so he's, he's telling them, you know, you need to be willing as well. We're talking about much more than just hardship. We're talking about actual death. That's what Jesus is talking about. And it's huge. It's extreme, I agree. But we would understand that outside of our context here in the United States, uh, there are many people who still look at this teaching from Jesus here in Mark chapter 8, and they apply it in a literal context, that they are willing to, to go to the nth degree for Jesus, that they're willing to suffer death for Jesus. And that's a concept that doesn't flood through our minds. Take up your cross. It's like, yeah, I know. Take up my cross. You know, I know what that means. You know, somebody might say, are you a Christian? Oh, in Jesus' day, it meant far more than that. There was a change in the law in China. And I'm going to read for you um, a portion of a statement that came out last month. That's how new and fresh this is. But back in 2017, the state council issued the new regulations on the administration of religious affairs and began implementing these regulations in February of 2018. And what I have in front of me is a joint statement by pastors. It's a declaration for the sake of the Christian faith. We're a group of pastors, pastors it starts out, Chinese Christians chosen by the Most High God to be his humble servants, serving as pastors for Christian churches throughout the various towns and cities. He goes on, and I'll just excerpt this because it's a little bit lengthy for our morning here today. But it says, ever since February of 2018, Christian churches across China have suffered varying degrees of persecution, contempt, and misunderstanding from government departments during public worship and religious practices, including various administrative measures that attempt to alter and distort the Christian faith. 
Some of these violent actions are unprecedented since the end of the Cultural Revolution. These include demolishing crosses on church buildings, violently removing expressions of faith like crosses and couplets hanging on Christians' homes, forcing and threatening churches to join religious organizations controlled by the government, forcing churches to hang the national flag or to sing secular songs praising the state and political parties, banning the children of Christians from entering churches and receiving religious education and depriving churches and believers of the right to gather freely. We believe that these unjust actions are an abuse of government power and have led to serious conflicts between political and religious parties in Chinese society. These actions infringe on the human freedoms of religion and conscience and violate the universal rule of law. We are obligated to announce bad news to the authorities and to all of society. God hates all attempts to suppress human souls and all acts of persecution against the Christian church, and he will condemn and judge them with righteous judgment. Did you get that? We have to announce, we've got bad news for you, government. You're you're in danger of being judged by the one true, righteous, holy God. Wow. Did they go on? We're even more obligated to proclaim good news to the authorities and to all of society. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, the Savior, the King of mankind, in order to save us sinners, was killed, buried, rose from the dead by the power of God, destroying the power of sin and death. In his love and compassion, God has prepared forgiveness and salvation for all who are willing to believe in Jesus, including Chinese people. At any time, anyone can repent from any sin, turn to Christ, fear God, obtain eternal life, and bring great blessing from God upon his family and his country. For the sake of faith and conscience, the spirit, for the spiritual benefits of the authorities in China and of society as a whole, the ultimately, and ultimately for the glory, holiness, and righteousness of God, we make the following declaration to the Chinese government and to all of society. I'm going to read two more parts of this. Here's the amazing thing. What would you do if our government took away our freedom? How far would you go to maintain your testimony? And how far would you go to continue to worship God? Many would no doubt shrink back. Many would shrink back and say, well, it's too bad. We can't go to church anymore. They close the doors. Oh, that's over. Or maybe we'd become a state church, and then, well, you could go, but you couldn't hear this, you couldn't hear that. The pastors who signed this, and you can see the names, which have now tripled. This came out in September. But you can see the names. Not only did they write their name down, but they wrote the name of their church down too. And this is the declaration to the Chinese authorities that was posted on Facebook and mailed to Beijing. Christian churches in China are eager eager and determined to walk the paths of the cross of Christ and are more than willing to imitate the older generations of saints who suffered and were martyred for their faith. We are willing and obligated under any circumstance to face all government persecution, understanding misunderstanding and violence with peace, patience, and compassion. For when churches refuse to obey evil laws, it does not stem from any political agenda. It does not stem from resentment or hostility. It stems only from the demands of the gospel and from, for a love, from a love for Chinese society. They're willing to say, we're not trying to be negative here. We're just trying to carry out the gospel. For this reason, we believe and are obligated to teach all believers that all true churches in China that belong to Christ must hold to the principle of the separation of church and state and must proclaim Christ as the sole head of the church. We declare that in matters of external conduct, churches are willing to accept lawful oversight by civil administration and other government departments as other social organizations do, but under no circumstances will we lead our churches to join a religious organization controlled by the government to register with the religious administration department or to accept any kind of affiliation. We will not accept any ban or fine imposed on our churches due to our faith. For the sake of the gospel, we're prepared to bear all losses, even the loss of our freedom, and our lives. That's last month here in this world that we live in. You see, I would submit to you that Mark chapter 8, while it may not resonate 
with us the same way it resonated with the audience that Jesus was speaking to is still relevant to people in the world today. And maybe it'll be relevant to us, but maybe not. It doesn't really matter. What really matters is that we understand the significance of what Jesus is teaching. Jesus is teaching that this is all about saying goodbye to ourselves and hello, Jesus. I like that song, So Long Self. Have you ever heard that one? So Long Self, just about getting behind me. I don't want to have myself in control. You see, what we see here in this passage is that Jesus is calling us to a radical abandonment of our self-identity and our self-determination. We're called to join the march to the place of execution, if that's what's called, calling for us to do. We're not talking about giving up chocolate for Lent. But as uh, Best says, it's not the denial of something to the self, but the denial of the self itself. When Jesus is calling us to deny ourselves, he's saying, leave yourself behind. Leave all of those things that you're pursuing in this world and push it all behind you and be fully dedicated to me. Pick up that cross, even though it is gilded with shame, even though the world will find reproach for you in unmeasurable ways. He says, if that's what's required, do that and follow me. Keep your little ribbony thing there in your Bible if you want to. Go over to Matthew. Would you just flip over there? I want to show you Matthew chapter 13. Because there's always that tug and there's always that push. Pulling one way, pushing the other way. You say, well, what would motivate me to want to give up myself or to push self-interest behind me? Notice in Matthew 13 in verse 44, we have two parables here in this passage I want you to see. Jesus is teaching, he says, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found, and he hid it again, and from joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has, and he buys the field. The treasure is so valuable that he is willing to sell everything that he owns so that he could buy that field which contains that treasure. Notice the next parable. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had, and he bought it. He was looking for pearls. He finds one. It's the pearl of great price, as it's known. It is so valuable that he had to have it, and because he had to have it, he was willing to push everything else in his world aside, sell off everything that he had, and get that one pearl. What's Jesus' teaching? What's his point? You see, the treasure and the pearl is none other but Jesus himself. It's the realization that Jesus is the true anointed one. He's the true Messiah. And there is nothing more valuable in this world than pursuing Jesus with everything inside of me. Do you believe that's true? That's the type of discipleship that Jesus is calling his followers to. You want to be a follower of me? Jesus said, put all of it behind you. That's a lot easier than done, isn't it? It said, we can say it, we can talk about it. But it's a lot harder to do in reality. Push all those things behind. See how important I am and pursue me with everything. Deny yourself, be willing to pick up that cross and follow me. That word follow is an interesting word. It's used over in John chapter 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And the sheep there are pictured as submitting to the shepherd. Why? Because the sheep knew the voice of the shepherd. They were committed to follow him even though they were prone to wander. Jesus is calling us to a level of discipleship that's higher than we often see today. Without a doubt, it's something that is critical for the church to be able to succeed in carrying out the mission. It's very difficult, if at all possible, for the mission of the church to be carried out by people 
who are less than devoted to Christ. And yet that's oftentimes what I see our willingness or I see our level of commitment to be, only partial. There's a reward for discipleship. Go back there to Mark chapter 8 and you'll see it there. Jesus continues his teaching when he has uh, made this statement. He says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. The person who's trying to save his life, this is a conundrum of sorts, isn't it? It truly is a conundrum in the sense that, okay, um, I don't understand. You mean losers win and winners lose? I mean, how do we, how do we reconcile that? Well, the losers are actually the ones who are going to win in the end. And that's what Jesus is saying. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. Those of us who want to be followers of Jesus Christ, laying aside all of the things of this world, have much to look forward to as followers of Christ. We can give it all up, but we're giving nothing up. Amen? We're giving nothing up. What are you really giving up if you say, well, I'm going to pursue Jesus and him uh, alone in my life? There are many people on the flip side of this that we see the, the winners who are proverbial winners in our society today. People who are, who are people of esteem. People that when they speak, people listen. People who are very, very wealthy today. People who seem to have everything going for them. You know who they are. They're people on TV. You know, half the people on TV, when they talk, I have no idea why they have any information at all to say. It's like, well, I played this on TV. It's like, well, great. Why do you know about this then? I, I'm just a little stupid that way, I guess. Um, but the reality is, isn't it true? That those who are pursuing this world and all the things that are pursuant to it have nothing to show when it's all done. They have nothing to show for it. And that's why Jesus says those who seem to be winning, in the end, they have nothing. The richest people, the most successful people in the world, if they died today and they stood before the Lord in heaven, and they asked, so, you know, so, you know, you know who I am, Lord. It's nice to meet you. You know, you probably heard of me. I was on TV quite a bit, or I did this, and, you know, I've got so much money down there. It's just amazing. So, so tell me, Lord, how much does it ta take to get into the kingdom of heaven? How, how much do you need, you know? Uh, I'll get my guy over here to write a check, or maybe you want gold bars. I got plenty of that, too. <laughs> What's it take? And Jesus would say, none of that is going to get you entrance into the kingdom of heaven. You see, you were a winner by the world standards down there, but you missed out. You pursued those things which were temporary in nature, and now they're gone. And the winners then lose. The ones who really win are the people who see Jesus as preeminent in their life. They see Jesus as being worthy of everything that I'm driving myself towards. He's worthy of pursuit because he's that important. As we look at this passage of Scripture, we see some great significances here because we have to choose, don't we? We have to choose. I think of that movie, uh, the Indiana Jones movie, when they have all those chalices in front of them. And he says to the girl, he says, well, you know, which one is it? And she says, I don't know, let me choose. So she chooses this, the, 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 the cup, and he begins to drink out of it, and, and he, it wasn't the right choice, right? I mean, all of a sudden, you know, the skin, the bones, everything's off, and he blows up, and, you know, he's laying in dust on the floor. And uh, right after that, you see the, the knight sitting there. And I just love this part, you know, it's just, a, it's great. Warning. I don't know if you heard that. We'll get it louder for you next time, right? But it said uh, he chose poorly. <laughs> well, when life is on the line, it's important for us to choose wisely, isn't it? It's extremely important that that be the case. What would you do with Jesus? What if you were in that audience when Jesus was teaching? What decision would you make? Would that call to follow Jesus truly be one that was easy to make or would it be difficult to make? I think it was easy to make if 
if following Jesus meant I could be part of the, the whole scenario of the Roman government being brought down. Jesus sitting on that throne. There's an illustration in David Plott's book, Follow Me, where he gives the illustration of a woman named Ayan. She's part of a community that prides itself on being 100% Muslim. To belong to Ayan's tribe is to be a Muslim. Ayan's personal identity, family honor, national standing, and social status are all linked with Islam. Simply put, if Ayan ever leaves her faith, she'll immediately lose her life. If Ayan's family ever found out that she was no longer a Muslim, they would kill her without question or hesitation. Now imagine having a conversation with her about Jesus, and you start telling her about how God loves her so much that he sent his only son to die on the cross for her sins as her savior. And as you, uh, as you speak, you sense her heart is actually softening towards what you're saying. At the same time, you feel her spirit trembling as she contemplates what it would cost for her to follow Christ. With fear in her eyes and faith in her heart, she looks at you and asks, how do I become a Christian? And in his study book, he asks the question, how would you answer her? And he proposes two ways to answer her question. The first is to tell her how easy it is to become a Christian, and if she simply would assent to certain truths and repeat a particular prayer, she can be saved. That's all it takes. The second option is to tell her the truth. You can tell her, though, that through the gospel, God has called her to die, literally to die to her life, to die to her family, to die to her friends, to die to her future. But there's more. In dying, God has called her to live in Jesus as part of a global family that includes every tribe, tongue, and nation. He's called her to live with friends who span every age. He's called her to find a future in which joy will last forever. Now, she isn't imaginary. She's actually a real woman who made a real choice to become a Christian, to deny herself and live in Christ no matter what the cost was. And because of her decision, she was forced to flee her family and friends. Yet she's now working strategically and sacrificially to spread the gospel among her own people. How would we respond? You see, it's interesting here in America as we view the teachings of Jesus through our mindset it's so much more difficult to understand among people who may be required to give up their life if they want to be a follower of Jesus Christ. You and I, as well as every single person going all the way back and all the way forward, have the option of placing our faith in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Salvation is by faith alone. What would you do if the decision to place faith in Jesus Christ meant that you might face death? That's the message that Jesus is bringing to his audience. That's the message that the disciples are hearing, and they're hearing it clearly, and we would understand that all but one of them is going to die for their faith. What level of discipleship do we truly have at this point in our life? What are we willing to do for Jesus Christ? As a follower of his, are you willing to deny yourself, leave it all behind, and pursue him alone? Let's pray.